Welcome to the Global Health Insights Podcast. I'm Pauline Chu in Media Relations at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. In this podcast, we are going to be talking about low back pain. It's the leading cause of disability globally. And we are fortunate to have the research team of a recent study that has been published in the Lancet Rheumatology with us. We have Professor Manuela Fajeda of Sydney Musculoskeletal Health at the University of Sydney. We also have Dr. Jamie Steinmetz, who's Managing Research Scientist at IHME, and Dr. Garland Culbreth, who's also a research scientist at IHME. So thank you all for joining us on this very important topic. Uh, Professor Fajeda, let me start with you as the first author of this paper. The team looked at 30 years of data of low back pain around the world. What are some of the key points that we should uh, take away from the paper? Um, thank you so much, Molina, and thank you for having me. Um, I think the, the number one key point would be that low back pain is still the main cause of disability um, around the world. It has been since 1990. And the absolute number of cases has been increasing over the years, and it's projected to increase even further. So I think that's the main message. Um, other very important messages would be that um, for the first time, we actually established that the peak prevalence of back pain is in the older um, age um, population. So it's around 85 years of age, which contradicts what we, we used to believe, you know, we used to believe that the peak prevalence of back pain was around 45 to 55 years of age. Um, this is alarming because, as we know, the population is aging. Um, and the older person affected by back pain will usually um, present other comorbidities um, that will impact their um, health even further. And um, at the moment, we I don't think we have the right strategies to address that problem. So, so to me, those were the, the key messages um, of the paper. So we will talk about some strategies and policy recommendations in a little bit, but first let's break out, break down the issue of low back pain. Uh, Jamie, in terms of risk factors, uh, Dr. Steinmetz, in terms of risk factors, what are some of the key risk factors that are causing low back pain? as we see this increase in the peak age going from 40 to 45, now to 80 to 85? And so for the Global Burden of Disease Study, we've looked at three risk factors for low back pain um, and found that they all contribute to uh, low back pain prevalence. Um, yeah. So those are uh, occupational ergonomics, uh, smoking and obesity. Um, and together, you know, combined, um, about 39% of low back pain burden is attributed to those risk factors. We think, you know, it's really important to, to think about them and um, prevention around those three different areas. And what are some other uh, risk factors? Uh, Dr. Culbreth, I know you, you not only looked at um, ergonomics, but some other modifiable risk factors. Well, we also considered uh, high BMI and smoking, because those are also GPD model risk factors. So we considered their contributions as well, and we looked at the patterns and how they also impact it. So a lot of people will say, okay, smoking, like what exactly is it about smoking that could possibly cause low back pain? So there's a few theories. Uh, one of them is that microcirculation can become... Uh, aggravated in the discs, and that makes the spinal column more prone to injuries. That's one theory. Uh, it also can be a confounder for behavioral, like low activity and things like that. So sort of a situation where there's a lot of working theories. Okay. And, and then in terms of the high BMI obesity, is it what we would sort of logically conclude that if you're carrying around more weight, it it might put more stress on your low back, or, or, or are there more reasons to this? Well, that's one component that, that's part of it, but there's also other parts, like it can, association with inflammation, for example, like a whole body inflammation in the case of a really high BMI. Yeah. All right. Um, Professor Fajeda, another interesting uh, takeaway from the research is that you found that low back pain globally seems to impact women more than men. Why is that? 
A very good question. Um, we can't say the reason, the exact reason why yet. Um, there are some studies being conducted at the moment. Um, we actually looked in the past, we looked at twins um, and a population of um, zygotic, monozygotic twins and dizygotic twins to see if gender actually drives um, the difference that we observe. And we, we couldn't see any difference in those studies, um, meaning that it might not be biological. So that difference might not be because of biological differences between genders. It could be because women um, tend to seek care more often than men. And this has been observed in other conditions as well. So um, what we can um, assume with, with the data that we um, found was that um, women probably report and seek care um, for back pain more often than men. And this is this is what we are observing in the prevalence as well. And, and if that's the case, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Vajeda, if women are reporting more than men, is that going to be a problem in terms of men being undiagnosed or, or untreated? It could be. It's, again, a very good question. Um, it depends on how we define um, under treatment for back pain, because at the moment, I think we are over treating back pain. Um, so I think a lot of people with back pain are actually seeking care without having to seek care because they don't have the, the right um, knowledge and message out there. Um, so is it possible that women are being more treated than men? Yes. Is it possible that men are being under treated? I'm not sure I agree with that. Mm, okay. All right. And, and one of the statistics that uh, we saw from this paper is the projection into 2050. And uh, Dr. Steinmetz, I'd love your take on this, because if we're aware of low back pain as the leading disability globally, why are we going to, why do we need to prepare for this 36% increase 30 years from now? So as you say, a 36% increase. So, you know, right now um, we're estimating that there's, you know, about 620 million people worldwide uh, who experience low back pain. Uh, and so, you know, then if we increase that uh, with these, you know, a kind of estimated, pro uh, you know, progression, then we're thinking around 843 million people uh, in the year 2050. So that's just, you know, an enormous number of individuals kind of across the, the age span, of course, you know, um, we, we do see this kind of higher prevalence or rates at oldest ages, but we are estimating low back pain in children all the way through adulthood. Um, so a lot of the reason that we're projecting this increase um, is due to changes in population structure um, and in particular uh, kind of an aging population. So, um, you know, as we've talked about, since we do see higher rates um, as people uh, get older, as we have, um, an old, you know, a larger proportion of the population that is older, going to start to see more cases. Um, and so, you know, I think just, just thinking about that absolute number, it's so important to think about preventative strategies um, and, you know, really uh, education around uh, protection. Of the yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Before we get to those preventative strategies, I'd love to look at regional numbers and, and what, what the trends that you saw there. Uh, Dr. Culbreth, in the paper, you looked at where you saw the highest occurrence of low back pain and the lowest. And Dr. Steinmetz had mentioned um, aging as well as population growth. How does that all play into some of the, the countries that popped up in your paper, like high occurrence in Hungary and the Czech Republic, low occurrence of back pain in the Maldives and in Myanmar, for example? So this is actually a bit complicated. If you look at just the number of cases, and then you compare that to the population structure in those locations, you'll see that in Myanmar and the Maldives, the population skews a little bit younger. And so it's not picking up the age pattern that hits that high peak towards the upper end of the age range and prevalence. However, if you then look at the age standardized rates, you see the same locations high and low on the high and low end. So you have to dig a little bit deeper. And this comes down to, we also estimate uncertainty, not just the plain numbers. And so the regions have their uncertainty bands, and each of these locations have an estimated uncertainty band as well. And these are the highest and the lowest locations, but they're 
well within their regional sort of band. And they're very close to other neighboring locations bands as well. So they're not proper outliers. There's no like special underlying thing pushing them up. They're following the data we have, and those are just happen to be the highest and lowest ones. Okay. And, and Dr. Culbraith, Cul 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 when we look ahead at the projection uh, up to 2050, are there certain regions of the world we should be paying attention to where, you, where you're projecting certain trends? Well, we certainly saw the biggest increases in sub-Saharan Africa. And again, due to population structure changes, aging and growth, et cetera. All right. It's a fascinating paper. Uh, Dr. Fajeda, let's dive into uh, policy recommendations and treatment. Uh, you had mentioned earlier that you think that you believe that many people are not treated properly and are not receiving preventative guidance. Uh, flesh out what the what the problem is and what some of your recommendations would be. Mm. So um, there seems, and, and um, we published a, um, a series of um, three papers a couple of years ago calling for um, global action on how to manage back pain. Um, and, and some of the points that we highlight is that people with back pain seem to be getting um, a lot more the passive types of therapies, such as um, um, analgesics, for example, or even physical um, act, um, physical agents or physical therapies that are very passive and are less likely to get the more active um, um, therapeutics, which would be, for example, exercise. And this is even more accentuated in the older population. So, so there is, of course, the um, opioid crisis. In Australia, for example, back pain is the number one reason for an opioid prescription. And um, we see this across the globe. So there is this emphasis on medication um, and less emphasis on exercise. The problem is the patient with a new episode of back pain who doesn't get better, they will um, develop persistent back pain and um, they will then seek other more complex and costly interventions such as surgery. Um, we do know that a number of the surgical procedures offered for people with back pain are not supported by high quality evidence. So um, it, it is actually a very complex um, answer to probably a complex um, question. We, we are not offering overall, we are not offering evidence-based um, treatments for people with back pain. And they, they tend to get more chronic and they tend to use more complex and costly interventions. Um, going back to prevention, Again, our prevention strategies overall are not very effective, um, and we are not very good actually at implementing them um, across the globe. And these would be improving knowledge and um, beliefs around back pain for the general population, for clinicians, for patients. These would actually also be um, getting people to become more active trying to um, bust that myth that if you have back pain, you have to sit, you have to be quiet, you cannot move, you have to um, lay down in bed. So all of those beliefs are actually have been shown not to be true. So trying to change the way people perceive back pain. It is okay to move even if you have pain in the back. It's okay to stay at work. It's okay to return to work. You might have to need to um, change your activities and uh, modify um, the extent, the duration, and the type of activities, but it's okay to move. All right. And, and Dr. Steinmetz and Dr. Colbert, do you have anything to add? Because either we've all had back low back pain or we know somebody who's had low back pain. So this is of high interest to, to people around the world. I mean, I think, uh, you know, also maybe on the occupational ergonomic side, um, you know, just emphasizing that this is really important, um, both in terms of workplace and workplace policy, um, but also, um, you know, for employees and, and really thinking about that and, and maybe the setup that they have and, and the importance um, of kind of considering that for their own health. So I think we're, we're happy to be able to, you know, provide or shed some light on uh, different risk factors that, that are important. And Dr. Gul Culbraith? Mostly echoing similar sentiments because this is such a huge 
cause, then we need to be paying attention so that we can make sure everybody's able to do live their lives well. Yeah, and you know, you brought up an interesting point about activity, physical activity, because as you say, Dr. Fajeda, if you're suffering from pain, your your instinct is to go and rest. But what you're saying is you actually might need a little bit more activity. Can you just explain why? Yeah, um, sure. So many reasons, again, um, some of them more related to how you interpret your body and, um, you, you know, the more psychological aspects of pain. But also, if you look at the spine, um, there are a lot of um, small joints in the spine. The spine was made to move. It provides stability to the trunk, but it was really made to move. Um, our body was made to move. So um, staying when you actually stay in the same position, whether it is sitting down the whole day, standing down the whole day or lying in, in um, bed the whole day, that actually contradicts what your spine is supposed to be doing. Um, so it, not only movement is important because of how you perceive pain and how you perceive your body. So not only the psychological aspects of pain, but also the biological aspects of pain. It needs to move. Um, your body needs to move. It's a fascinating conversation. And thank you so much for your research, Dr. Manuela Fajeda, Dr. Jamie Steinmetz, and Dr. Garland Culbreth. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.